Okay, today we're going to talk about impulse as a continuing math flick in our segment trying to understand propulsion. And uh, what we're looking at here is a thrust curve. Uh, and if you uh, watch the math flick on thrust, uh, this is a thrust curve for that motor. Actually, that's actually not that motor. It was a Q motor. This is a, another thrust curve for another motor we did, uh, which is a P motor. And we'll talk about what that letter designation means here in a bit, right? But uh, it turns out that uh, impulse is related to our thrust force, and uh, so we need to kind of, kind of go investigate that a little bit uh, because uh, we can use impulse as a tool uh, to compare different types of rocket motors, to compare their performance, compare their designs, and also use that impulse uh, to predict and better predict uh, how our rockets are going to behave when we use any particular rocket motor that generates a particular amount of thrust. How, how, how that's actually going to behave in terms of, of, of the rocket and performance we're going to get out of the rocket. And we can use that to then start to set criteria uh, uh, in terms of impulse that we may need to accomplish a particular task with the rocket motor. And so this allows us to start engineering rocket motors and engineering rockets. So impulse is a very important category. So why don't we get into some more depth here and try to understand uh, specifically what impulse is. So uh, here's a, a video frame capture from that rocket motor test. If you haven't seen it uh, in the thrust now flick, it's, it's pretty exciting. Um, and uh, in this particular case, we've actually uh, uh, plotted a burn here. Um, and so what we're looking at in here, let me get my pen all fired up here, is we're looking at a plot of the thrust force, right, which goes up along our y-axis here. And plotted over the x-axis here is time, right? Over which it, it, over which we uh, we burn the rocket motor, right? So if we were to kind of take a look at this thrust curve, we see that this particular rocket motor, uh, you know, fired right up uh, uh, and burned and exhibited anywhere from about 2,700 upwards to let me just say that's roughly 2,700 there and. What we got up here, we're roughly, you know, 3,200 newtons of thrust, and then it kind of died back down again here, and then it obviously it ran out of propellant, and uh, at close to four seconds, the rocket motor had basically expended itself, right? So, so there's a thrust curve, right? And you say, well, okay, that's great, Tom, but how does this relate to impulse? Because we're talking about impulse, right? Well. To understand that, we've got to go back to Newton's second law again. Uh, and uh, to restate that, what we said was in Newton's second law is that force basically is equal to the change in momentum over on an object of which that force acts uh, over the time of which that force acts on that object, right? So we can do some mathematical rearranging here. To get a little bit different relationship with this, so if we multiply both sides times the change in time over which that force acted, that thrust force acted, right? We'll see that these cancel, and we get a new relationship that says that for our rocket motor, um, actually that's a P, that's a bad P, but we'll say it. for that rocket motor, our change in momentum is that that rocket motor will create inside any rocket that it's in is equal to the thrust force it creates times the change in time over which it acts. And that, by definition, is impulse. Right? And I, think, I think actually Newton, even in his Principia paper, uh, talks about uh, an impulse imparted on an object. Right? So that is the technical definition of impulse, it is the change in momentum an object receives uh, when, when a force is acted upon it over a period of time. Um, but we want to talk a little bit more deeply about what that means in terms of our rocket motor. Um, and to do that, we're going to take a look at our rocket motor curve in a little bit more detail. Now, let's just choose a particular change in time, a particular delta t, and let's just say for giggles, we're going to just choose the change in time from like one second to three seconds, right? And, uh, and of course, we're going to say that during that time, we're going to say on average, let's just say, choose a point, let's just choose this point right 
here. I'll make a big, big red point as we can see it. We can say that on average, that rocket motor ex exhibited 3,200 uh, newtons of force from one second to three seconds, right? Right. So if we were to then do that multiplication and calculate that impulse, we would take three seconds minus one second, which would be that delta T in there, right, would be two seconds. And we can say on average, it, it was two seconds uh, times 3,200 seconds where it, where it exhibited there. And we could come up with a number, right, that would say, well, two times 32 is 64. So we say on average that would be 6,400, right? Did I do that math right? I think so. I think that we'd say we, we would say that during that time interval there, that time interval delta T, we had 64 newton seconds of impulse. And that would be true, right? As the total impulse during that interval. Now, you say, well, wait a minute, Tom. You know, that's not exactly right, because if we go take a look at what you did there, I'm going to get a different color. You know, you included this area in here, because you did this square kind of averaging out, choosing 3,200, and yet, clearly, at the early part of the burn here, we weren't at 3,200. We were down around 3,000. And also, over here, you know, on the other side, we also weren't at 3,200 newtons. We were maybe even down lower than that, maybe down around 2,900 newtons. And so you've got some error in here, so we're not exactly 6,400. And I would say, yeah, you know, you're right. But what if we made our big strips really tiny? Like, let's say we, we, we made a really tiny strip right here, and we made it, you know, one one thousandth of a second, each of these strips. So we're going to just basically take this big strip and break them into a bunch of smaller time intervals, right? right? And then calculate the area in any one of these strips. You know, going to kind of fill in the strip like we're going to you know, calculate the area there. And we're going to do that based upon whatever the average was at the point where that strip touched the line, right? So they'd all be touching the line at different places, right? And you say, okay, well, that's fine, Tom. Why do you want to do that? Well, if I did that for all the way across this big strip, you know, I may end up with, with you know, a thousand or ten thousand of these smaller strips, but I could add up the area in each one of them and then add up all the strips. And then I wouldn't have this blue error in here anymore, would I? Right? Right? Well, so so what if I made those strips even smaller than like a ten thousandth of a second? What if I made them like a billionth of a second in, 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 in width? And you'd say, well, then you'd have to add up like a billion strips. And I'd say, yeah, that's cool. That's what we have computers for. Computers can add up a billion of strips like in, you know, in less than a second, right? So so, so when we do that, um, what we get to is a, a new type of, of, of ways of adding up areas under curves. And if you've had calculus uh, in college or in high school, or maybe you've watched a Khan Academy video on integration, um, you'll see that this is, this is by definition what, what, what integration is, right? And so we can rearrange our equation. So when we make a, a thickness of a strip really small, uh, we talk about that not in terms of delta t, but in terms of dt, right? d means a differential, where a differential is a very infinitesimally small strip of time in our case here, right? And we're saying, well, we're still multiplying that times what the thrust force is where that strip actually, that infinitesimally small strip touches our line, right? And we have a mathematical symbol, kind of looks like a snake standing up on his tail, called an integral. And can go learn about integrals if you want. Um, there's tables of them for different types of functions, right, here. But for our function, um, when you add up all these strips, right, uh, in there and get that total area under our curve, it's still the total impulse, right, that's there. Uh, and this is the formal definition of total impulse, right? And it basically says integral means break it up into small strips that are then evaluated at each point along the line and add up all those strips times the thickness of those strips. And that gives you the total area under this curve. And so the total impulse of a rocket motor is the total area under its thrust curve, right? Um, and you say, okay, that's cool. Uh, why do we care about that? Well, because 
from Newton's second law, what that means, that total impulse, if we put that rocket motor into a particular rocket, right, it's going to impart a change in momentum in that rocket. And if we know how much that rocket weighs, that is not the propellant, but just the rocket itself, so we'll say the mass of the rocket, right, since momentum is conserved, right, uh, under the laws of physics, then if we know the change in momentum and we know its mass, we can basically divide both sides by the mass, and we'll know for a particular rocket motor how much faster our rocket will be going, right? We'll know its velocity, how much faster it will be going with a particular rocket motor that we put in it, right? So that's, that's kind of useful because if we have a whole bunch of different types of rocket motors that we build and we know their impulse, right, um, then we can predict how fast any particular motor in our rocket of a known weight will go. And we, and we look at our, our math flick on performance, you'll know that if we know how fast it's going when that motor burns out, that will predict how high it will go, right? And so we can know how high in the altitude we can get. And so we can start using total impulse and impulse uh, for particular rocket motors to design our rockets to do useful things and know and have high confidence of, of where they're, where they're going to go and how they're going to behave, right? So, so that's a pretty useful aspect of total impulse, right? But what if we want to compare different types of rocket motors, right? Rocket motors that maybe are made with different types of propellant, right? Maybe a liquid rocket motor versus a solid rocket motor, um, things of that. Well, if you remember from the Navflicon thrust, we remember that the thrust was created by ejecting mass out of the back of the rocket motor. So just like we plot the thrust of, of, uh, of the uh, thrust force of the, of the rocket motor as a function of time, we can also look at the weight change in the rocket motor. If we've got like a scale that the rocket motor is sitting on on our test stand, we can measure how the weight of the rocket motor changes. And as a result of that, if we were to then break that into little strips, just like we did before, right? All right, for all of this, so down here we have some, you know, we've added all the areas up under our curve, we'd have some really tiny strips down here, right? They're getting smaller and smaller and smaller. But we could basically add up the area under all this curve, right? And what would that be? Well, this, this is basically plotting the mass of our rocket motor, right, as a function of time again, right? And so we can play the same game mathematically we did before by, say, taking our mass at any point, right? There's a point right there, like 45, and multiply that times the very small differential of time that we we did there, so that would be, you know, for that 45, that would be this little time interval right in here, right? Get the area of that strip, then add up all those strips, and that would give us the total amount of mass of propellant ejected out of the back of the rocket motor, right? You'd say, well, why is that useful? Why do we care about that? Well, if we take our total impulse, that we measured from the force that this rocket motor created for us, right? right? Which we said was adding up all the strips of the thrust force times that small time interval that it acted. And we divide that by adding up all of the mass that was exhibited out of the back of that, right? What we're going to get is the total force per unit mass of our propellant that that rocket motor produces, right? If that's the total thrust force that that rocket motor produces for us uh, over time. And this is going to tell us a lot about different kinds of rocket motors, right? So we can start doing this for all kinds of different rocket motors. Some of them are liquid and some of them are solids and some of them use different kinds of things. And we can start then giving them ratings, right? And so we do this in amateur rocketry. If you've built model rocketry, and maybe you've bought an Estes engine, you may remember an A engine. And an A engine, I think, has a total impulse, total maximum impulse of 1.25 1 Newton seconds, right? Right, Newtons being the force, and seconds being the time that it acts over, right? And then, you know, we say, well, 
If we double that, we go to the next class. So the next one, uh, double 1.5, uh, gives us 2.5 newton seconds, right? And I apologize about my handwriting here. Um, but you get the idea, you know, a C motor, right? That'll be 5 newton seconds. Let's put that at zero. There we go, 5 newton seconds, right? And you can play this game all the way down to the Q motor, which was the big one we had on our test stand uh, that we had the video for when you watched the math flicked on thrust, right? And that motor starts at 80,000 newton seconds, right? Wow, that's a lot of force acting over the period of time when it burns, right? That's, that's if you were to take that and divide it by 1.25, that's like almost 60,000 A motors in there, right? But when you do this over time, we call this not the total thrust, but the, basically the impulse, uh, uh, the total impulse divided by the mass uh, of the motor, we call this the specific impulse. That is, it is the specific impulse or the amount of force per unit weight of propellant, right? So it's kind of like an efficiency for a particular massive propellant we put in a rocket, we can get a rough idea of the total amount of thrust force or the total amount of change in momentum it's going to get. And then we can compare them and say, well, you know, for 10 pounds of a liquid motor, you know, you maybe get more thrust than 10 pounds of a solid motor, right? And, and so we can start to create a chart of these motors and get a pretty good idea of how to compare them and how to use them, use them to determine the velocity that our particular rocket is going to work with. So this becomes a pretty useful tool and a pretty useful chart um, as we start to then commercially produce rocket motors, or if you want to go buy a rocket motor and you need to go to a particular altitude, you can calculate the burnout velocity that you need to get there and then look at the math flick on performance to learn how to do that. Uh, but then you can say, oh, I need a C motor or I need a D motor or something. If I'm going to get my my rocket to that altitude well, for whatever the reason why I might want to be at that altitude, right? So, so impulse starts to become a very useful tool for us, right? So let's go take a look at the types of impulse again and review those, and then we'll wrap up our discussion on impulse, okay? So we've talked here before, we've talked about total impulse, right? Right, which was equal to the total change in momentum that that rocket motor was going to give us, right? And we said that that was basically adding up the area of our thrust curve, right? That we have uh, over the time with which that thrust acts, right? And that's our definition of, of total impulse, right? So that's total impulse. So that's one type of impulse we can work with. Another one we said was specific impulse, which we can use to compare different kinds of rocket propellant and, and the motors that they're in. It's, the specific impulse is not only a function of the propellant, but it's also a function of the nozzle and the rest of the rocket that's there. Um, and that is the change in momentum for the change in mass, right, that we exude out of the back of the rocket motor. And we can define that, obviously, as the integral uh, or adding up all those strips, right, that they act, and dividing that by adding up all of the mass of exhaust and material of the burnt rocket propellant that gets sent out the back, right? right? So this is the specific impulse of a motor. I wish there was an easier way to write with a mouse on the screen, but so this is impulse. But, right, so you get the idea. I don't want to drag out too much time because we're already getting on. So that's specific impulse as a type, right? Another really useful one is something called average impulse, right? And why do we care about that and what that is? Well, that's kind of like total impulse. Right? right, And by the way, the unit of specific impulse is just seconds, right? Whereas a total impulse, it's Newton seconds or pound seconds, pound times seconds, right? Because 
if you add up all the mass and multiply times g sub zero for its weight, right, then basically the units calculate give us units of seconds that are in here, right? So specific impulse, if you see an impulse value, you're not sure what it is, look at its units. If it's in seconds, you know it's a specific impulse and not a total impulse. But anyway, back to average impulse, one of the things that we can have is different kinds of thrust curves. And we'll talk a little bit more about this when we talk about designing rocket motors and some math flips on them. But, you know, we're measuring our thrust force. Some rocket motors, they kind of peak up really sharp and then they kind of drop off over time and then die, right? So, so here you have a lot of force generated initially, which might help get your rocket off the pad. And then once it gets off the pad, it's kind of a slowly decline. This is called a, a regressive burn uh, rocket motor uh, over time, right? And so you can say, well, if the force here, you know, maybe that's 35 newtons, right? And the force down here is maybe, I don't know, 15 newtons, right? And you say, well, yeah, and then over here, it's like, it's like 10 newtons, right? So which force, if we, I mean, if we're going to multiply these, which ones do we do? Well, we still add up all the area under here. And when you add up all this area, what you're going to find out, it's be the same as if, there was an average force acting over the time where the rocket motor burned, right? And we call that an average impulse, right? And so that, you know, it, it, we don't include the, you know, the, the area, basically the area under the curve averages out like this, right? And so that's another useful item. And you may see these on rocket motors that you buy and fly and work with if you look on the given average impulse, a total impulse, um, right? And, and, uh, um, and then also you uh, may see a specific impulse. You probably won't see those on most of the commercial motors you buy, but people who make rocket motors want to know a lot more about the specific impulse uh, because it's going to tell them a lot more uh, about how their, uh, their rocket is, their motor is performing and comparing it against other rocket motors. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll see you in the next math link.